Happy Thanksgiving, Dog Nation. Welcome into the Marlowe's matchup, where we take a look at Georgia versus Georgia Tech, the rivalry known as clean, old-fashioned hay. You can consider me, Brandon Adams, John Stinchcomb, the former UGL American, your brief reprieve from, let's face it, look, we love our families, we love the food, we love everything associated with Thanksgiving. There is a moment, though, especially if you've been Thanksgivinging all day long, where you're kind of ready for a break, so allow John and me to be that break for you here on this Thanksgiving evening. We'll talk some football, we'll give you a chance. You can pretend you're working, pretend you're taking an important <laughs> phone call from your uncle. You can do whatever you want to do, but allow us to be a little bit of a break for you on what is otherwise, I'm sure, a joyous holiday season. Well, Thanksgiving is one of my favorites, but we know when you're surrounded by family, sometimes you need to break away. Yeah. What a great way to escape. So I'm sure when stuff. you were playing, I'm sure it was tough because, you know, Rivalry weekend in college football, Georgia, Georgia Tech, has kind of always been that Saturday after Thanksgiving. And there were even a couple weird years before you were a player where, did your brother play? When they played uh, Tech on like Thanksgiving Day, I think there was a Friday game every now and then. So it is always kind of weird. I love Thanksgiving as well. And it kind of coincides with sort of the in-state rivalry game. For some families, that can be a little hard to navigate, I'm guessing. That's part of the tradition. Yeah. I mean, part of the tradition is Thanksgiving Thursday. And when we were playing, it was... You go to practice, and for us, my, my family would drive up. And Is that would, right? Yep. We would eat, uh, we'd eat lunch or dinner, and there would always be other teammates oh, that's from nice. South Georgia or out of state that had nowhere else to go. Well, your family, yeah. right? So we'd all pile into the apartment and have some turkey. Oh, together. that's really nice. Yeah, that's, that's a really good thing to be able to do. And I brought this up briefly, and now I'm trying to think. Did your brother play against... Tech on 95, which would have been Thanksgiving Day. When was he a freshman? Yes, 95. Okay, that's the day that Hines, we're getting really off the topic here, but uh, that's the day that Hines Ward played quarterback. and uh, He did it all. He yeah, threw he, it to himself one play, he, I think. He really was. It was kind of an amazing time. So obviously a lot of Thanksgiving intertwined history between both Georgia and Georgia Tech on Saturday. And obviously for Georgia, it's another example of playing the in-state rival with the other game in Atlanta the following Saturday, the SEC Championship, which is obviously the game that fans are the most excited about, but no one wants the idea of Tech kind of creeping on you, on you uh, having anything to brag about in the next 365 days, really being able to quiet that fan base and being able to say, we run this state once again. That's what's at stake for Georgia. And when you and I talked on Dog Nation Daily on Monday, one of the things we talked about is, in your senior season of 2002, you were the first Georgia team that played Tech knowing you had an SEC championship the following Saturday. The ultimate look-ahead opportunity, Tech wasn't very good that year, not very good this year. You guys beat them 50-something to 7, whatever the final score was. You know, how do you focus in on that? How do you make sure that, because listen, I mean, on Dog Nation Daily this week, we're peeking ahead to LSU. We're talking about LSU. Uh, you know, players and coaches are obviously a lot more buttoned up and professional probably than I am. But, but nonetheless, that temptation is there. How do you fight against that? Well, I think it's, the, uh, it's a healthy anger. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's a you're angry because you know what Georgia Tech's intentions are. And they want to ruin what otherwise should be a, a stellar season. And that holds true for this year and that Georgia's got an opportunity to finish 11-1 and one at the end of the season and, and heading into an SEC championship where you're talking about playoff implications, mm -hmm. that's huge. You don't want your in-state rival that you are better than to play spoiler. And it's almost upsetting that you think they've got this opportunity, they've got this mindset of we can ruin what should be so special for us. And uh, that's a good motivator. Yeah, speaking of good motivators, healthy anger, Georgia may also have some of that as well about trying to answer some of its critics offensively after three consecutive games, which Jake Fromm has been less than 50% passing Saturday against the Yellow Jackets, a chance to kind of correct that record going into the SEC Championship as well. Coming up in just a moment, I'm going to let you have a chance to hear what Georgia coach Kirby Smart has said about Fromm and his offense this week and a little bit on the Jackets as well. Before that, though, I'll remind you this is our Marlowe's matchup. My name is Brandon Adams. This is the former UJ All-American John Stinchcomb, and we are here with you here this week, but excited next week about being with you. The Marlowe's at Peachtree Corners for our live broadcast return ahead of the SEC Championship. It all goes down Thursday, December 5th. Marlowe's at Peachtree Corners will begin there that night at 6 p.m. We'll be there from 6 until 8. We'll show you the address here. 
5210 Town Center Boulevard, Petrie Corners. We were there a little earlier this year. It was an unbelievable time. It's going to be great as well this upcoming Thursday as well. Uh, a week from today, 5210 Town Center Boulevard, Petrie Corners. By the way, not just John and me, but as we head towards the start of the early signing period later on in the month of December, Jeff Sintel there to preview that from a recruiting standpoint. So literally our biggest Marlowe's broadcast of the year. John, Jeff, and me all there with you. Marlowe's in Petrie Corner starting at 6. And by the way, here's something we've never done before. We're actually going to do a Marlowe's Tavern VIP giveaway. Now this is amazing. This is, I think, a really good idea. So we're going to offer VIP seating for four. That means you get a nice, comfortable spot to enjoy the proceedings there that night. But even better, chef-inspired food from Marlowe's, incredible menu to choose from. How about dinner for four? Someone's going to win that. We're going to throw in a Dog Nation gift package there as well. You see the email address. Here's how you register. Send an email to dognationhelp at gmail.com. You see it? I'll read it one more time. Dognationhelp at gmail.com. Just put Marlowe's in the subject matter, kind of give us our subject line, give us your information and we can reach back out to you. And then on no December 3rd, someone's going to draw the winner. We'll announce it and you can be able to join us. And of course, everyone invited to attend, but someone is going to be a VIP winner. Dinner for four from Marlowe's and a whole bunch else to go along with that. All right, with that said, let's kind of get a little bit more involved here with George and Georgia Tech on Saturday. A quick look back from Kirby about what has not been going well for Jake Fromm as of late and what to expect from the Yellow Jackets. Here's the UGA coach as part of a Marlowe's matchup. You know, it's hard to put a finger on it. Uh, Auburn, they, they played really tight coverage. There's no real easy throws. I thought these guys, um, the guys who just play Texas A&M, their, their pass, pass efficiency defense is really stellar. They do uh, some good things defensively. Uh, their coordinator was at Notre Dame. He's done some really good things. So it makes it, makes it tough at times. But at times, you've got to hit the open guy. I think Jake would be the first to tell you that. We missed a couple and uh, made a couple. So there, there's no easy throws when you start looking at it out there. It's not like there's a gimme here or there. You, you try to get high percentage throws. And we had a couple of those uh, to the back in the flat and to Charlie and to the swing passes. But we got to do a better job uh, helping him out. And uh, he's got to do a better job hitting the ones when they're open. As you look at tech and tape from this year, have you seen them progress as the year's gone on, as they get more comfortable with the system? Yeah, I think their offense has grown, and uh, they got better and better from the beginning of the year towards the end of the year. It's like two different teams. I think they're, they were learning a new system. And any time you're learning a new system, you have growing pains, and you push through those. Um, their quarterback's done a tremendous job. We know him well, recruit him out of high school. Uh, James has been extremely athletic, and uh, he's, he's gotten better throwing the ball with every game. He threw the ball with a lot of confidence Thursday night, um, and their team's growing. I want to deal with both the things that Kirby Smart talked about there. Before that, let me just remind, we're not live today, so I don't want anybody to think I'm being, you know, stuck up and not taking comments so rude, and not interacting yeah. with the audience. Y'all know that's not my typical motive. I'm typically very involved with the audience. We are in home right now enjoying our Thanksgiving with our families. I didn't make John come drag it in here on Thanksgiving night. So we pre-recorded this to be able to deliver this to you and that's why we're not taking comments here right now. I never try to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, pretend we're live and we're not. So we're not live here today. But as far as what Kirby Smart talked about, we'll do the tech thing and then kind of work our way back. I think that Tech is in an interesting spot with, with Jeff Collins as coach because when you make a huge changeover philosophically, it's obviously a very difficult thing to do. Bill Connolly, a writer for ESPN.com, calls these kinds of things a year zero. Like it's almost such a reboot that it's not even technically Jeff Collins' first year. It's his year zero year where you're just trying to lay the groundwork to eventually be able to lay the foundation the following year. I think that's probably well said. The one thing I think in future years we're going to hear a lot more about is, and I don't think that, listen, Jeff Conn's a pretty good recruiter. It takes a long way away from taking a player that Georgia really wants. But we didn't even mention recruiting in the Paul Johnson era. And under Collins, that's one of the things that is going to be different. They're trying to be a player on the scene in recruiting. Georgia has chosen not to recruit the, the, the state right now particularly aggressively, so that's an opportunity for Tech to get some of the top high school players here right now. And in future years, I think as long as Colin stays there, we're going to be talking about a Tech team probably having just more composite talent than what we've had in the uh, Paul Johnson era. But we're a long way away from that right now. There have been some moments when Tech's played hard. You know, they got to win against NC State on a Thursday a couple weeks ago. They went on the road to Charlottesville, Virginia, 
probably the best team in the Coastal, uh, the Cavaliers. They kind of kept that one somewhat close. They've had a couple moments this year when they played relatively hard, but this is not a talented team. No, and, and I think they were a system team. You, you yeah. had recruited guys that fit in the Paul Johnson system. I thought it was an incredible system. He was probably the best in that particular genre yeah. of, of offense. The only thing is it doesn't translate very well to any other style right. of, of team. And so Jeff Collins is very much, I'm sure when he was hired, told them it's going to take a number of years to get the type players that we need. It's not a condemnation of their talent mm. they currently have. They just don't fit well in what Coach Collins is trying to do over in, in Atlanta. And that's going to take time. That's a good thing for us as, right. as dog fans because there is a transition that is occurring. Now at some point, I'm sure there's going to be a handful of recruits that both teams are going to go for. I don't think we're anywhere close to that right now. Although Coach Collins is making that push yeah. where he wants to be at That's least right. in that conversation. That's right. And as I said before, you know, Georgia recruiting nationally as much as they do opens the door for that a little bit. As far as the Georgia part of this, you heard Smart addressing the three straight games where Fromm's been below 50% and, you know, kind of offering whatever explanation he can offer for that. And if you want to go back and look at Saturday's game, the honest truth is against Texas A&M, I don't think you can blame the play calling. I didn't think the play calling was a problem on Saturday. I, listen, there are always going to be moments where just philosophically speaking, Smart's a little more conservative than I kind of wish he was. Mm -hmm. But within the boundaries of what we kind of already know the Georgia offense is, you know, they tried to throw the ball to Swift some. They tried to get the ball to Pickens. You try to get him involved. They even tried to do some hurry-up stuff a little bit more against Auburn. It's just not working right now. And, and for Fromm, who has been a great quarterback before and I believe will return to playing in a high level again, he really just hasn't been himself the last few weeks, has he? No, and I think offenses, when they, they feel like they're capable of more and you start pressing, you start to slip a little in that you're trying to build momentum, you're trying to get chemistry, you're trying to get identity. It's weird to talk about it 11 games yeah. into a season for a team that's ranked in the top five consistently. So uh, the, the, the issue on Saturday, for any player, what they want is a fair assessment. Yeah. Don't, don't criticize me when I don't earn it. I think Jake's a big enough boy to understand he missed some throws. There yeah. were some throws there that he should have hit on that he didn't. And, and that's not undue criticism. He recognizes there were some opportunities that he didn't execute on. Yeah. And I think he's capable enough to where uh, it shouldn't be recurring. Has, has there been a string of games where this offense hasn't performed to the top of their ability? Absolutely. I think there's still opportunity for them to grow. And when you have a talent base like they have, especially in that locker room, that's why the frustration comes. We yeah. talked about that uh, on, on the Daily Show on Monday for the fan base and that there's so much talent that they feel like you seem across the board, they're capable of so much more. So I'm going to take my analyst hat off for a minute, put my fan hat back on. And I'm going to say something that not every fan is going to agree with, but I feel very strongly about. There's a temptation to want to say, boy, you really need to see something this Georgia offense going into the SEC championship game. You really need to see them against an overmatched opponent, go out there and flex, and just really kind of finish the regular season on a high note offensively. I understand that temptation. It, it can be kind of frustrating watching a team play below what you think its typical standard would be. But for me on Saturday, I don't care. I want to win the game. <laughs> I'll take it by a skinny point. My main thing is just don't get hurt. You know, you know go out there, be – be healthy, get a win. You obviously have to win the game. I'm not looking for style points on Saturday. I'm not, I don't care about Tech chirping about, oh, we kept it blah, blah, blah close with Georgia. I don't care about that. I want to win. And whatever's going to happen offensively, just save it for LSU. I mean, I hate to be that way because I know for some fans, they really want to feel better about the situation and playing well against Tech would provide that. I'm just, I'm just telling you right now, the only thing I want are the guys who are healthy now to be healthier going to the LSU game. I don't want Cajun to play at all. I just want, I want guys to stay healthy. Yep. Well, I, I agree. I think as you set uh, priorities for this game, what are some goals? The number one goal should be win, right? Yeah. We've got to win. Number two, stay healthy. These yeah. guys, you should be able to beat Georgia Tech without your quote-unquote A game all your studs out on the field. If Lawrence Cager needs another week to heal this shoulder and now he'll be better served for the SEC championship, by all means, there should be other receivers that can step into that role and defeat a Georgia Tech team that is reeling right now and in year zero, not even the rebuild right, year yeah. yet, right? Yeah. So 
health is number two priority. But number three, I think you can build some efficiency with this mm. offense. I think there's they're reeling a little bit. You see some frustration starting to peak its head up a little bit because they want to be better than what they've sh- shown these past few weeks, whether it's finishing against Auburn, uh, the three and outs that you saw, and, and just the efficiency. That's an opportunity for Georgia to kind of build that momentum. I'd like for Jake Fromm to have that confidence that he can hit throws. He's one yeah. of the, his, uh, statistically and historically, he's been one of the most efficient quarterbacks right. in college football. Right. So it's a rarity to see him sub 50% on his throws. Get that confidence back. He's a talented guy. He just needs to find that rhythm. We're going to hear from Georgia tight end Charlie Warner here in just a moment about the game with Georgia Tech. Before we get to that, though, let me kind of set up Warner's comments by saying this. One of the things that I think is really interesting about Kirby Smart, and I won't cite all the examples here, but I can cite a number of examples over the years, where Smart, I believe, lets it be known that as a UGA alum coaching this team, one of the things he understands is the nature of rivalries. Now, if you ask him, if he were here right now, or for you ask him during a press conference, hey, what does the rivalry game mean to you? He's going to say, well, all games mean the same, and it's rivalry this, but Georgia's got a lot of rivalries. He is very politically correct when asked about this publicly. But subconsciously, between the public words, there are these little tells here and there where the rivalry game does seem to probably matter to him. For instance, in 2017, that was the game after Georgia Tech where he acknowledged something we had spent that entire year talking about of revenge tour, revenge tour, revenge tour, beating all the teams that beat you the year ago. Well, after that game, he said, you know, some people call this a revenge tour. I guess we finished it off today. Obviously, beating Tech meant something to him in that moment. He had lost to Tech back in 2016. And, John, I think that's really cool. And in a game like this where it seems like Georgia doesn't really have anything on the line, already clinched the East, not expected to be challenged by Georgia Tech, looking ahead to uh, LSU the following Saturday. The fact that Kirby says, at least privately, not publicly, but privately, rivalries matter to me. I like beating Dan Mullen in Florida. I like beating Gus Malzahn in Auburn. I like beating whoever the new coach is at Georgia Tech. I like beating these guys. As a Georgia fan, I think you enjoy that. And I think it makes you feel confident going into the game. You're about to hear from Warner on this. You'll hear from Tay Crowder on this, where... They are not allowed to look ahead because I I would imagine behind closed doors, the conversation about playing Georgia Tech is a lot different than it is publicly. Well, I think the first and foremost, the the discussion is we need to prove to them they don't belong. That's right. You don't belong in this discussion. You don't belong on the same tier that we are. But talk is cheap. You cannot just say you don't belong because Georgia Tech, I'm sure, believes Given the right opportunity, the game plays out. They'll watch that South Carolina film and say, hey, we can do this, right? Well, you need to create four turnovers, have a blocked field goal. I mean, all those things have to fall in place. But Georgia needs to silence that. They need to silence that discussion and thought process for Georgia Tech to say that we belong on the same field. The only way to answer that is with your helmet and your play on Saturday in uh, in, in between those sidelines you know, you have a hundred yard field, you got to own it. And, yeah. and that's what silences that discussion. And it does get your blood boiling a little bit because if you don't handle your business, you hear about it forever. Mm-hmm. We're all in the same state and you're going to hear the chirp that you don't, you don't want to hear. You know, it's out there. And as long as you keep it silent, they, they keep their one Georgia Tech sweatshirt tucked away in their closet and never bring it out. That's the way it should be. <laughs> that is John Stinchcomb, the former Georgia All-American. I'm Brandon Adams. You are watching the Marlowe's matchup here, brought to you by our friends at Marlowe's Tavern, the delicious chef-inspired food that they have made famous. We're big fans of that, and we're glad to have them presenting the Marlowe's matchup to you here tonight as we look ahead to Georgia and Georgia Tech. And with all of that in mind, speaking of the game against the Yellow Jackets, Georgia tight end Charlie Warner, who's been a part of a lot of these contests, he spoke about his feelings about his final game against the in-state rival. Here's Charlie Werner as a part of our Marlowe's matchup. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's stress-free, but I'd say it's a lot more, uh, their knees are going to feel a little better come Saturday. You know, <laughs> over these last few years, always playing uh, triple option, and they just, the guys over there are getting cut the entire week. I mean, even on Thursday, they're getting just cut, cut, cut. Um, it's not stress-free, but yeah, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna be, uh, you know, be, be a lot more ready, and it's not just a bizarre offense. So, you know. Do you and your uncle ever go back and forth about the fact that he was here during the special era, and, and now you're in a third straight SEC championship game. I mean, both of y'all have played at Georgia in pretty special areas. Yeah, I mean, we talk about it, but nothing, nothing too much. Uh, I don't. We, we really don't talk about a lot of football. I've been uh, 
I know, we kind of just talk about what it, like hunting and fishing and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up in a Georgia family, though, how much was put on this rivalry as a kid and kind of as you grew up around college football? Yeah, this game's always been the, the big game, you know, like the, I love the rivalry week thing anyways, you know, you all, all around the country, this is a big week for football. Um, it's always been a big thing, uh, you know, to a lot of people in Georgia, and it's always fun to watch this game, because it doesn't matter the, the record of each team, each team brings just a different level of, of intensity and passion in this game. What do you think about finishing up, going yeah, undefeated? Does. Actually, I was going to that was finishing up on a streak with three in a row. Uh, yeah, no, it's awesome. Yeah, we definitely, uh, I guess that was my freshman year we lost to him at home. Yeah, but um, that would be awesome to, to finish it up three and, three and one. So it's interesting. He talks about going three and one, winning three straight against Georgia Tech. Sometimes it's easy to forget that there are guys in this roster that have actually lost a game to Tech dating back to 2016. And it kind of reminds me, Mike Johnson's a friend of mine, played at Alabama, played for the Falcons, you know, part of the first national championship team for Saban at Alabama. Tells a great story. He was also on the 2007 team, Saban's first year at Alabama. They lost to Auburn, which had been a long streak of Auburn wins versus Alabama. And Saban, before that, had been a very successful coach. And I'm sure, according to Mike's telling of it, maybe he thought he was going to slip into the Iron Bowl and start the dominance of Auburn right away. But that first year, it was Tuberville and Auburn that got the victory over him. And all of a sudden, I love the way that Mike has told the story on our shows before. He says it goes from being, hey, the Iron Bowl's a rivalry which is important to Alabama to suddenly it's a rivalry that's important to me because I've lost a game in the series. And I do think, you know, Charlie talking about, hey, rivalry week matters to me. I like the fact that we're a part of something that's celebrated all around the sport of college football. And he does have, along with some other guys, some institutional memory about having lost a game here. So that is a little bit of extra motivation of no one likes to be the Georgia player that lost to Tech. And for these guys, they can look back to really just three years ago and remember a time in which that was them on the other side of that. Oh, man, that's such a terrible taste in your mouth that stays. Yeah. You know, I mean, three years removed. But I remember that game. I remember watching uh, from the stands going, ooh, this one's going to stick with you a while. And it does. As a player... It kind of haunts you, and, and you can really reference that feeling that you had in your gut mm -hmm. knowing that you lost a game that you shouldn't have yeah. against a rival that you're going to hear from for the rest of your career mm -hmm. at Georgia and beyond. So uh, for those seniors, for those guys that were on the team that experienced that, I guarantee that's a sentiment that's expressed to those that weren't around for that game that this is important and not a feeling that we need to experience anytime soon again. Charlie brings up the positioning of clean old-fashioned hate in between the rest of the rivals, whether it be Ohio State, Michigan, Iron Bowl with Alabama and Auburn, South Carolina, Clemson. It's sometimes hard for me to figure out where Georgia, Georgia Tech fits into that landscape. Because on the one hand, the differences between the two schools, the fact that you know Georgia is a state university, Lux football, Tech kind of thinks of themselves more of an academic type school, sometimes not as much of a recent football history of success. The schools can feel really different. Sometimes that makes the rivalry fun and special. Georgia fans think of Tech fans as nerds. Tech have their own, you know, kind of, you know, rip back at Georgia. You know, sometimes the difference between the two schools kind of makes the rivalry fun. Sometimes the schools seem so different, it's almost like they don't necessarily value the same things necessarily. So sometimes it's kind of hard for me to figure out where Georgia, Georgia Tech fits into the rest of the rivalries. I look forward to the game, but I've never been quite so sure if it's a great rivalry or not, if that makes sense. Well, it's not a national rivalry. Yeah. Nobody else outside of the state could care about the Georgia-Georgia Tech game other than uh, I would assume Georgia's going to win again. But right. if you live in this state, it's a huge rivalry. I care more about Georgia-Georgia Tech in the outcome than Michigan-Michigan yeah. State or any of the rest of them because it's at home. Yeah. And for this state, yeah, it's a, it's a good old-fashioned hate week. And you're a guy that you know, you grew up in the Atlanta area. So I think the closer you grew up to the Tech campus, the more likely you were to know some Tech fans, the more likely you were to kind of, you know, be influenced by Atlanta media. And so you probably grew up maybe thinking about Tech a little bit more than some other guys that maybe you played with at Georgia that are from South Georgia or some other place. Living in the Atlanta area, that might make the Georgia-Georgia Tech rivalry a little bit more important to you. I agree with that. I also think that you look at guys that are, I mean, now our team is made up of national players. You got guys from Texas and New York. Yeah. We didn't have a lot of those before. I think Musa Smith was one of the few that was out of state that was, you know, one of your main contributors, but he, they learn pretty quick the importance of that in-state rivalry and they, they can reference their own, whether they grew up 
in a state where there was a, a rivalry they're familiar with. I mean, it doesn't take long for you to pick up on those things. Well, it's funny that you should mention that because Georgia linebacker Tay Crowder actually talked about that this week, about how guys that come here into the state of Georgia to play their college football, how they become ingrained to what this rivalry means to so many people. Here's what Crowder said about that and about the Yellow Jackets as well. They just kind of pick up on. I mean, it's something they pick up on. The coaches do a great job of, uh, you know, just explaining that it's hate week and that, you know, they take it serious. So it's, that's that. Hey, what, what was it like after Georgia lost to Georgia Tech? Did you, did you play a role in that game, or where were you at in that game? I wasn't playing in that game, but I mean, I felt it in my stomach, you know, just being on the team and knowing knowing it was hate week. Uh, it, it wasn't, I mean, no no game loss is a, a good feeling, so it, it, it wasn't uh, good for me either. Well, I was just thinking, you know, for that particular season, I mean, to end the regular season that way, I got to think that, I mean, were, were people angry or despondent? I mean, how would you describe the locker room? Uh, I think it was more for the seniors, you know, just playing that last game. And, uh, it just didn't feel good. It wasn't a good feeling. How nice is our office nice that you're not having to worry about the offense that they used to run compared to what they do now? Very nice. Uh, <laughs> I used to hate, you know, just coming to practice, just going through that stuff. It was, it was crazy, you know. Uh, but I mean, we, we, we glad they're not doing it, but we don't look, really know what they're gonna come out and do. So we'll see. So it seems like a lot of the Georgia players are enjoying not having to prepare for that triple option offense anymore. It's kind of funny. Crowder said that. Uh, I think you know a lot of guys have kind of said that. Yeah, it's kind of nice not having to worry about that. When you listen to so many Georgia players to say, yeah, boy, it's great this week. You're not having to worry about that triple option offense. If you're a Tech fan, you may be like, well, maybe we got rid of this coach too soon. <laughs> if Georgia's this happy about not playing it, then, then maybe there was something really going on there. But if you look the last couple of years, you know, once Georgia started basically like stacking its inside linebackers and like sending a linebacker to occupy the pulling guard and leaving the other inside linebacker free to just like wreak havoc, Pretty much the, the triple option offense was like folded up and put in their pocket at that point in time. No, no defensive lineman. Even it, when you win those games, do they feel like they won that game? Yeah. Because you hate getting cut. I know every defensive lineman I ever played against despised being cut. When you play the triple option, yeah. it is not fun for a defensive player in the box, linebackers included. Now, the rules have changed a little bit to where they were so limited as to right. how you could cut and where you could cut and who could cut that it changed their opportunities. The triple option teams were restricted. But with that said, it wasn't a pleasant experience, even when you won. Yeah, no doubt about that. So Georgia, Georgia Tech comes up on Saturday. It's clean, old-fashioned hate. We're previewing that here tonight on the Marlowe's matchup. Also looking ahead to a great event for us one week from today. We're going to be live at the Marlowe's and, and uh, Petrie Corners for our Marlowe's matchup looking into the SEC Championship. Really the biggest Marlowe's event we're going to do this year. And one of the things that makes it even bigger and better, the fact that in addition to John Stinchcomb being there, me being there, Jeff Sintel going to be there as well as we kind of get ready for uh, the SEC Championship, the start of the early signing period. And we're going to be uh, giving away a VIP giveaway there that night as well. So here's what all you have a chance to win. VIP seating for four, dinner for four, talking about the delicious chef-inspired food, new fall menu, whatever you want from Marlowe's, dinner for four there as well. We're going to throw in a Dog Nation gift package. Send an email to dognationhelp at gmail.com. That's dognationhelp at gmail.com. Just put Marlowe's in the subject line. Let us know who you are. We'll draw the winner. Someone's going to draw it on December 3rd. We'll make that announcement. You can be there with us for December the 5th. And we really invite everyone to be there, 5210. Town Center Boulevard and Peachtree Corners. That's 5210 Town Center Boulevard and Peachtree Corners for our Marlowe's matchup. Of course, John, that's next Thursday. This is this Thursday, Thanksgiving. We're doing this as a recorded broadcast. So as this show airs live around 6 p.m. on Thanksgiving, what's Thanksgiving like in the Stinchcomb household? Well, we have uh, family descending upon us. We have close to 50 folks that hopefully will have some, what is it, Tryptophan, what would? I think tryptophan, that's the thing. Or, yeah, is it tryptophan, <laughs> I think, when you feel like you've gone, gotten sleepy from eating all that turkey? Oh, it's all the turkey. Well, we uh, yeah. have the TV on, watching some good it's ball great. games, getting ready for uh, Saints-Falcons yeah. uh, in a few hours, that's I guess, right. at yeah, this that's point. That's exactly right. right. We're kind of like the pregame show for that right that's now. That's it. Uh, Buffalo Bills, Dallas Cowboys, actually a pretty good game. So 
Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's obviously a great time. I love Thanksgiving. I've always loved it. I just think it's, I mean, I, I like the entire holiday season, but I love the way that Thanksgiving kind of kicks it all off, and I'll be enjoying some food with my family there as well, my parents' house and uh, my wife's parents, and just kind of just really enjoying, you know, a great time. And for all of you who are no doubt enjoying yourself as well with family and friends, we appreciate you allowing the Marlowe's matchup to be a part of your Thanksgiving event, whether you watched us live here uh, Thursday night or kind of at some point in time during the weekend. Thanks for sharing that with us. And as I mentioned, the holiday season fast approaching. And as for some of you, that brings along the anxiety of buying gifts for various people. Some people can be hard to buy for. Well, the good news is right here on the desk in front of me, you see a really cool holiday gift item that's just sort of calling out to that special someone in your life. It's the hover helmet. Now you can see this thing is floating, suspended in midair right now. It's really magical technology that makes this happen. I'll never really understand the science behind this, but I like watching it every each and every week. And I know that you all, uh, many of you have asked, you know, BA, how can we get our own hover helmet? Well, you see the website on your, uh, on your screen right there. It's dognation.com. It's, I'm sorry, let me try that one more time. It's hoverhelmets.com slash dognation. Let me say that again. Hoverhelmets.com slash dognation. Now, when you go there and use the promo code dognation, promo code dognation, you're going to get 20% off your order while supplies last. They've got the hover helmets in stock. The Georgia helmets are back. They're taking those orders from you, getting them ready for the holiday season. So, hoverhelmets.com slash dognation. Use the promo code dognation. And that's a great way to get a really fun piece to add to your desk or the basement or whoever on that list for you that can be hard to buy. If they're a UGA fan, I know they're going to love this because it's that sort of next must-have memorabilia item to celebrate your fandom for Georgia football. John, hope you enjoyed the Thanksgiving weekend, the game on Saturday. Looking forward to the SEC Championship. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at Petrie Corners a week from now. It's going to be a great time. Well, I'm thankful for uh, this show and UBA. I'm thankful for the Dog Nation, and I'm thankful that we get to wear red and black That's instead right. of anything orange. That's so. exactly right. Well said by John Stinchcomb. All of you, thank you so much for being with us. Enjoy your holiday weekend. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We'll talk to you again next week at the same time, right back here at the uh, Petrie Corners location for our Marlowe's matchup.